Hello. Um, thank you all for coming today. Um, this is our uh, October Urban Design Forum, which is usually an evening event, but this time is a lunchtime forum hosted by the Frist. So thank you, Frist, for having us again. Um, how many of you, this is your first time to come to an, a Nashville Civic Design Center event? Okay, great. So um, let's get started. Just wanted to do a couple of intros um, and tell you about some more events that we have coming up um, throughout the rest of the year. Um, how many of you have been to a Pachacacha night or a Pechacucha? however you want to pronounce it. Okay, so our next one is actually next week on the 18th, and the theme is sound space. So we'll have presenters talking about um, everything that comprises Music City, um, whether that's lighting, design, stage setting, or um, their individual music career. So um, look forward to that at the CMA space on Music Row. And our annual luncheon is where we raise um, a good majority of our funds for operating expenses at the Civic Design Center. We are a nonprofit organization. So our annual luncheon is taking place on November 2nd at the Music City Center. And um, if you work with a company that would like to sponsor, we're still getting sponsorships. And otherwise, we'll have uh, individual tickets for sale on, on our website. Another exciting project we have coming up is the Letters to the Mayor. And this is a project that has taken place across the world in really great cities. It started in New York City as part of the um, storefront for art and architecture. So Nashville will be the first city back in the US. They're returning to the US. So we're really excited to have this project come to Nashville and to be in our space at the Nashville Civic Design Center for three months. Um, it'll be transformed into an exhibit room where we'll have over 100 letters from local architects to the mayor and on November 30th, we will present those letters to her and have a conversation. And then that'll be open for the next three months. Also, it'll be open for each art crawl, the downtown art crawl, the first Saturday of the month for December, January, and February art crawl will be the closing date. So look forward to that on the 30th. But you are here for the Urban Design Forum, and I'm excited to um, introduce our speaker. Um, I'd like to also thank LP Building Products for making this possible, for bringing him down here. This is also a partnership with UT College of Architecture. So we have design students looking at um, developing concepts for a new downtown building um, using this new technology and wood construction for high-rise buildings. Um, Yugan Kim is our speaker, and Yugan is a founding um, partner of IK Design. He is also the associate director of the TSKP Architects in Boston. Prior to establishing IKD, he was the, um, with the Renzo Piano Building Workshop um, since 2006, spending two years at their home office in Genova, Italy, before overseeing the construction phase of a recently completed extension of the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum in Boston. He's also worked at Carlos Zapata Studio in New York, New York City, um, on a number of projects including the Soldier Field Stadium in Chicago, the Batexico Financial Tower in Ho Chi Minh City in Vietnam, the Cooper Square Hotel in New York, and a number of private residences. In addition to his professional practice, Yugan serves as the chair for the Boston Society of Architects Museum and Exhibition Design Committee. Co-chair of the Harvard Asian Alumni Alliance in Boston, he is a faculty member at Rhode Island School of Design and has taught design studios at Wentworth Institute of Technology and Northeastern University. Before studying architecture, he was a sculptor and also worked as a custom furniture fabricator through which he discovered his love of materials and craftsmanship. He holds a master's degree of architecture from Harvard University and a bachelor's degree in fine arts from Bard College. So um, give a uh, warm welcome to Yugan and I'm really looking forward to his presentation. Thank you. looking at me. <laughs> Hello, uh, my name is Yugan Kim. Uh, thank you for having me. Uh, thank you for um, coming out in this uh, kind of little rainy day to hear my talk, so I appreciate it. You have to excuse me, I'm, <clears throat> I'm recovering from my second cold from 
over a three week period uh, that my daughter brought home. So my voice is a little scratchy. So if you can't hear me, just uh, yell and uh, tell me that you can't hear me. Uh, thanks for the intro. Um, as you can see, I have a uh, kind of diverse background um, that has led me to this interest in timber construction. Um, so before we start, uh, can I get a, um, a raise of hands of people who know what cross laminate timber is or mass timber is? Okay, so I didn't know that. So I'm going to go through some basics uh, that well, I'll go through a little bit faster. Um, but uh, we'll go through and we'll talk about, I think, uh, some of my own insights in terms of learning about the reasons to build with timber and some applications that we've done uh, being a, a small firm. Uh, so a little bit about uh, my background to expand a bit more and maybe some of trying to understand why we are so interested in timber is that, uh, yes, I, I was a sculptor. I used uh, wood for a long period of my life, you know, uh, making uh, material that was readily available. Um, and then I worked on this uh, a larger project in Boston uh, at the Isabella Story Garden Museum. And it was an incredible opportunity uh, to work with an uh, architect named uh, Renzo Piano. Um, but, uh, and it was, it's something almost like a dream where you can start from the beginning to the end. Uh, but during that time, uh, I felt a little bit um, guilty because of building of that caliber uh, is one that is quite expensive and not many people actually go see. And so it made me question what the impact and the value of design can be in a structure that uh, not that frequented and that expensive. And so through, since then, I've been trying to discover and find for myself what is the value of design and what can design's impact be. And so I'll show a little bit about my own evolution in terms uh, since then, uh, which led me to uh, you know, this kind of deep interest in timber, as well as the reasons behind uh, a number of the projects that use timber that I'll show uh, near the end. So, for those who don't know, there's a big uh, timber renaissance that's happening now with engineered timber. Uh, there are timber structures that are going uh, up around the world. Um, and uh, whenever I say a timber building, uh, these are the questions that everybody pops in their heads. So it's the elephant in the room. Uh, it's the thing that is the biggest hurdle for uh, anyone to get over. And so we'll talk about these as we walk through. Uh, and try to dispel some of the myths that exist uh, uh, with timber construction. So these are some examples of uh, when I was uh, a bit younger, some of the uh, kind of wood-based sculptures that I did. Always fascinated with wood at different stages of its uh, processing, uh, always often uh, pieces that were discarded or left over. Um, and that was a theme in terms of understanding and reusing material, uh, recycling and upcycling material that has stayed constant uh, throughout uh, uh, my work. So about uh, six years ago, we had uh, the opportunity to curate and design an exhibition in Boston uh, at the Boston Society of Architects. Uh, and we pitched a exhibition uh, that was to be about timber architecture. And at that time, we, uh, as architects, my business partner and I, we were thinking of it as a much more conventional uh, exhibition where we would showcase some beautiful timber structures and uh, talk about the cultural relevance of that through, throughout the world. Uh, but as we sat down and thought about the exhibition and the development of it, uh, we realized two things, is that we really didn't love architectural exhibitions in general because they were typically only for architects and very insular. And that was a problem of the profession in general, is that how do you uh, create a narrative uh, exhibition that a larger group of people could appreciate and understand and create a narrative so that people understood the benefit of timber architecture. So these are some images of uh, uh, the exhibition, and we had this kind of uh, 
uh, student comp uh, competition where students had uh, fully funded installations that they would explore. But you know, through this evolution of understanding uh, the exhibition that we pitched, and as we delved into the research, we discovered a few things that were eye-opening. And at that time, I wasn't familiar with mass timber. So uh, I was learning about, I was learning about the, uh, this new timber technology uh, almost in real time as it came to the United States. So we discovered images like this, where uh, these large timber panels, uh, which many of you may be already familiar with, uh, that come in lengths of uh, 40 feet long and 10 feet wide in this panelized system, could be erected at incredible speeds, uh, changing how timber buildings, uh, how buildings could be constructed. And so as we uh, developed the research, we realized that uh, this had the potential, not since the industrial age, to change how our cities were built. And what was remarkable to think was that America originally was built with timber. Our cities were built with timber. The reason America was colonized because was one reason was the abundance of timber. And because of urban uh, fires and perhaps a misunderstanding about how to use timber correctly, uh, it was uh, no longer used in cities, and then steel and concrete ruled. And after doing some of the research, we realized and we believe today that uh, our, the urban landscape will include timber buildings down the streetscape. And just imagine that, that no longer is the city just steel, concrete, and glass, but has timber uh, alongside it. What we also came to realize was that uh, timber was a high-tech material. It wasn't, the misconception was is that although it is the most ancient building material, it's also one of the most high-tech. It merges analog and digital technologies together and finds the best marriage of the two. And this idea of using laser scanning and robotics and CNC to uh, make a uh, timber structures that are incredibly efficient was a kind of remarkably eye-opening. But it was this statistic that really uh, brought new focus. It was at the time when uh, the UN had just released a report that uh, indeed climate change was real and that the two main contributors, um, well, the main contributor to climate change was uh, carbon dioxide. And having an understanding that uh, buildings contribute over 50% of uh, carbon emissions, it seemed to only make sense that architects have a responsibility to rethink how buildings are built. And you can see the statistic now says 2016. At the time, it was 2011. And every year I do this presentation or a variation of this, I change it because this statistic of the highest measured carbon, the highest global temperature, and so it just shows this urgency about uh, how we should address this issue about buildings being such a major impact to climate. The other item was is that it, we also started thinking a bit more that I, I'm probably many of you here are uh, very concerned about where your food is sourced. Uh, what f the food that you consume, um, but still not yet uh, are people as concerned about uh, the spaces they inhabit and the material that create those spaces. And it seems that that should be just as important. This idea of farm to table, uh, sh there is, should be an equivalent of that and a consideration of that about how we built our built structures. And so this is kind of the narrative and the idea that was the basis of the exhibition is that rather than having an exhibition that had uh, building precedents or models in the center, we highlighted a material. Uh, we highlighted uh, an understanding of the material and what we did is we broke down the material in different phases. So similar to the farm to table where you have you know people planting, processing, it's shipping, um, we did this 
analysis, which is called the life cycle analysis of the material. And for those who don't know what that is, it's really a kind of study of a product and its embodied energy, the energy that it consumes or the energy it doesn't consume, the carbon it uses, the carbon it doesn't use, to understand what its impact it is environmentally. So really, and we'll go through it quickly, uh, timber remarkably uh, provides a benefit to uh, almost everything, oddly, uh, at every phase, from when it's a tree, when it's being harvested, when it's being processed, when it's being manufactured in construction, and even when living within it. And when you pair that through comparison with the conventional way of building with steel and concrete, um, the, it's remarkable how clear and common sense it is to build with timber. And so, for me, since I've only been in this realm for five or six years, I went, it's really kind of a, this is really an un, uh, kind of unfolding of my own kind of experience. And so uh, we'll walk through that a little bit. So this is kind of the equivalent of uh, that farm to table diagram. Uh, it's a, even bit more complex because you think about how it impacts rural economies as well. So the first phase, why harvest with wood? And so uh, wood stores carbon. It's this remarkable uh, thing that Mother Nature created, which uh, uh, extracts carbon from the atmosphere and stores it in the fiber of its material, and then you know, also releases oxygen for us to breathe. Uh, the idea, and it's hard to see because of, I apologize the resolution, is that the idea is that you are to uh, harvest timber at the apex of its carbon collection ability because young trees, they can harvest and uh, they can sequester carbon at a faster rate than more mature trees. And so the idea is uh, you should cut down those trees at the apex of its carbon collection ability and lock that material into a building and then plant new trees that will then grow faster than a, the mature equivalent then that cycle is completely repeating and repeating. The other reason, obviously, is that uh, wood is the only uh, r real uh, building material that's recycled, uh, renewable. And it grows by the power of the sun for free. I mean, uh, if someone gave me that deal, uh, I would probably take it. And then it's a, a kind of low impact material. So, uh, when I was young, my mother would always tell me, you know, you look at the ingredients of uh, food before you're consuming, the longer the ingredients list is probably not great. You know, timber uh, is uh, much more like a single source material, whereas you think of the equivalent of concrete and steel. It takes many more kind of components to make it, um, and that just has a larger implication in terms of embodied energy and carbon footprint. This is another diagram just to explain um, why we're having this conversation as well, is because uh, mineral resources are becoming more and difficult to extract because the purity of them are uh, you know, more difficult to obtain. Uh, many people, they struggle with the idea of cutting down a tree. Uh, but if you look at the equivalent of trying to get iron ore from deep within the Earth's crust, how much more waste, energy, uh, kind of damage to the earth you need to do than selectively cutting down a single tree. Uh, there really is no kind of comparison. And I'm sure all of you have the image of a tree being cutting down. But if you pair it next to something like this, uh, I think the image says everything. Now, the next phase, why manufacture uh, timber products? And so, uh, when, again, when you compare the processes of cutting down timber and processing timber versus the equivalent of carbon, uh, the equivalent of concrete and steel, it just, those two, steel and concrete, are just incredibly high energy uh, processes. And I think, you know, we have all these uh, graphs that you can't read because of whatever, but if you just common sense, if I asked you, if I brought a a block of wood, steel, and concrete, and I ask you to cut it in half, um, I know which one would be the easiest one to do. And so that alone just, I think, should demonstrate 
uh, the energy needed to, to manipulate that material, translate that by a building scale, uh, that has a large impact, uh, both from an energy consumption standpoint, but also a carbon emission standpoint. Uh, many, in many cases, the, uh, every part of the tree is being used. Often, waste products of the uh, tree are used or downcycled for other building products or even used to heat or the facilities or dry the material uh, that the facilities are, are, are using. And so here's the comparison, right? You know what it takes to cut a piece of wood. Look at this, uh, the energy that is needed to process steel. So this is always the, one of the main issues. Why build with timber? And people are always concerned, doesn't timber burn? And I've spoken to you know, just regular people and then architects that are concerned about this. And the best way that I can describe it is that uh, Mother Nature has engineered the perfect material. And if you use it right, then uh, it is perfectly safe. And one forester told me the best way to understand it is that in a forest fire, all the thin trees burn and all the big trees stay there because Mother Nature has uh, designed a material that once it develops a char, it protects itself. And so if a building is engineered and designed so that uh, it can develop that char and retain structural integrity, then the building is safer than a steel, and a steel building because at a certain temperature, uh, steel will experience a catastrophic failure, whereas timber will retain its structural integrity. And so I didn't really believe this. So then I asked a number of kind of fire fighters in the area, the one actually down the street from my house, and they told me when these kind of old mill structures, you know, they, in, at least in New England, they have stand for a, forever and you can see the char on them and they feel much more comfortable going to these buildings than steel buildings because they don't know when the building is going to fall. Uh, this is a kind of great picture where you can see there's a uh, wood charred beam with the kind of steel slumped over just demonstrating uh, what I just described. Then this issue about the durability. People are always worried that wood's going to rot it's going to fall apart, but if you look historically throughout the, uh, the planet, uh, there are structures who have been here for th you know, hundreds of thousands of years. And then if you just look again at the, the redwood tree, it's been here forever. And so it's been engineered to withstand the elements, if used correctly. This other item in terms of uh, why live with timber? And so there's been these very interesting studies about the biophilic uh, characteristics of uh, wood, how it lowers stress levels. And so the idea is that with the modern living, that we're relegated to interior spaces and urban spaces more and more, uh, our bodies, in some people believe that our bodies are constantly under attack. And so being surrounded by natural elements uh, puts our stress levels down. And so um, in a room that is clad with timber, they did these studies, and the stress levels of each individual uh, were lowered. And you, know, you can see these kind of interior spaces of timber. Often I speak to architects who've designed some of these structures, and they say, uh, you know, a, a person comes and hugs a wood column or touches the wood, uh, a wall. And that very infrequently, you hear that with a steel column or a concrete column. There's not that, uh, um, I guess, natural relationship. And it's hard to understand where that is. And some people I spoke to is maybe is when we were children, we played with wood blocks. Um, but it, it's something is that we are connected with nature. And by, by putting ourselves in interior spaces, we are removing it. And so wood brings this also kind of experiential uh, characteristic that we've been missing. It's important to know that I'm going to talk about cross-laminated timber, which is the kind of new hot topic of the day, but there is a whole slew of timber technologies that exist. Um, it's, I think it was a really 
we have to look to the kind of urban fires as a reason why many people don't know about these timber products, but also why there's been not much development in timber uh, technology is because, you know, once timber was uh, no longer allowed to use in kind of urban centers, there was less and less incentives for building product companies to develop um, those type of products because there was no money in it. But now since there is this kind of push and what we think is a renaissance of a uh, building with timber, th this, there's this incredible product development that's happening now. But we're going to sp uh, speak mostly to cross laying timber and uh, some of the work that we've been doing. I think just quickly we should talk about the fact that engineered wood have been around for a very long time. Um, you know, in Europe, uh, there are buildings there that have uh, used it and uh, are still standing quite uh, proudly. Um, and so if we understand this idea of glue lamb structures, it's basically using small pieces of wood to make a larger piece, which is an incredibly efficient idea, especially when you think of the idea that I spoke about earlier about using small trees because they remove carbon at a faster rate and then that cross-section cross is smaller and then you apply those things together, laminate them together to make a larger span. And so it's a wonderful kind of connected relationship that has um, environmental impact qualities but then also has uh, wonderful building applications because using small pieces and putting them together actually is a benefit to using uh, uh, timber because some people say uh, timber has defects, other people say it has character, uh, but if you laminate it uh, together it disperses that those flaws or the weaknesses within the entire cross sections to allow you to achieve incredible lengths of um, spans or heights. And so you can see here uh, this idea of how they use the material here. So this is uh, cross laying timber. And so it's basically using the idea of glue lamb, but instead of all the material being laminated in one direction, you're per layer, it's uh, uh, turned 90 degrees. So you're basically making the equivalent of a piece of plywood on steroids. Um, it is immense. And so the, you can see this image on the right. This is uh, from a company called Smartlam in um, Montana. And so they've been building um, elevator cores. And so depending on the height of the building, often when the elevators made, a core is made out of concrete, it maybe take one to three months to build. They can build an elevator core in three days. So that just shows the power of this material. You can see here it just what it comes in. It comes in usually odd layers, five layers, three, five, seven layers, and then you can get panels to 12 feet by 60 feet long. So these are massive panels. So it's, it's hard to imagine the application without seeing them in person. A lot of times I give these lectures and people ask if they're suitable for homes. No, they're suitable as a direct competition with steel and concrete structures. There's this building in London that uh, is called Murray Grove. And it's really, I think, the, uh, the precedent that has led to all these new mass timber structures that exist here uh, around the world. It, it was proof of concept because it was able to be built in one third of the time of a concrete structure. It was built with less cost. Uh, the reality was is that they had a team of three or four people that would come for four days in, or three or four days in the middle of the week and do a floor a week. And so it was, it was in an area that was of all concrete buildings. And the developer who built this building wasn't interested in timber. He was interested, obviously, in cost. And they did all these cost analysis and they realized uh, because timber, because these t timber panels could be erected straight from the truck, there was no staging needed. Um, they had to use, they could use very simple tools that didn't uh, uh, result in a lot of noise pollution in the area. Uh, they could build this building incredibly fast and for lower cost. And because of this, it is proof of concept for every other mass timber building that exists now. This is the other right, issue that everyone has in their head. And this is the picture that everyone has. But the reality is that uh, 
This may have been the way it used to be, but practices of forest management have changed dramatically, where they don't do this necessarily this clear cutting, but they're more precise in terms of how they uh, harvest their woods. And it just, uh, if you understand, right, if you are a landowner, you want to manage your crop. And you don't want to um, eliminate uh, your, your pool of money. And so there's just a desire to do that. And so the idea and the reason to build more with timber is that if you create more incentive to build with timber buildings, you'll also create an incentive for people to manage their forests more because then their crop has more value and then that cycle continues and continues because not only are you building more timber buildings which then allow that ask people to manage their forests more but then you are planting more trees to remove carbon from the atmosphere at a faster rate and locking that carbon into uh, the, the structure of the material. So it's this wonderful kind of cycle that exists using um, timber. And what's remarkable is that every week in the last two months, I get calls from a developer, a contractor, a senator's aide, a wildlife preserve, a person, a forester, and they all want to build with timber. And it's something that I imagine 15 years ago did not happen. It's a because of the developments of how timber is processed, how it's harvested, this new technology, um, people who usually uh, do not agree uh, now are on the same side. And just three months ago, there was a bipartisan bill introduced at the Senate, and we know how difficult that is, um, where promoting timber innovation um, here in the United States. Because this idea of reviving rural manufacturing jobs um, building and making with local materials. It's something that's a very current and apt conversation to have uh, right now. So that was my um, kind of uh, learning. That was the, what I learned during the research of that first process, uh, first exhibition. And then s between that, when that exhibition closed, there was a two year gap and then uh, this, uh, we were asked by the National Building Museum in DC to bring a show there that was uh, based upon the show in Boston, but to um, develop it further because of uh, new developments between those two years, but also to use the exhibition as a, uh, a backdrop so that policymakers could understand what the benefits of timber construction were. And that was for us as designers an incredible opportunity because we realized, because we've been searching about how can we impact uh, the world with design, we realized that through this kind of small exhibition, we could possibly impact uh, the world more than we could with a single structure. And so we went back to work and then we realized that when we first did the exhibition, there were no timber structures, in the United, mass timber structures in the United States. But in two years later, there were so many more. There were so many more every month. And even if I update this slide this week, there'll be more that are including. So it's this incredible uh, growth of mass timber structures that are, are occurring worldwide. So these are some views about the exhibition. And so in this one, we use actual CLT panels uh, fabricated by the two certified uh, CLT companies in the United States. And so within two years, there was no uh, domestic CLT manufacturing. And then after, in two years later, there were two already uh, that were certified making CLT for built structures. And so we utilize this. We use uh, CLT not only as material sample, but as also mock-up and installation. Um, and so we had this idea that we would separate the material from the masonry structure uh, so that you could look at the material, you could look at the uh, information, and you would have the material there in the backdrop. So many people also said that it was the best smelling exhibition that they ever seen. 
So in, this is just a simple plan. You can see how we distributed the panels. We had this idea of each of the center four panels talked about the life cycle, and then we had kind of periphery information. So once again, it was speaking about the material itself, which is unusual, I think, for an a, uh, a architectural exhibition where you're focusing specifically on a material but not actually a built structure. Uh, we also had this uh, comparison uh, video of the old way and the new way, and I'll try to get these, uh, this working, maybe you can see. So it's remarkable, the advancements that have been made. So this is from the harvesting stage where laser scanning is being done the way that people perceive logging and harvesting itself. The manufacturing advancements that have occurred. And then even in terms of construction, when you're imagining you're using 10 foot by 40 foot panels as opposed to maybe four by eight sheets It goes on and on, so I'll continue. So here's an another image. Our firm, what we do is we like to do holistic design. So we control all the graphics. We develop all the graphics. We uh, develop all the infographics. We do all the design. Um, so you know, we design this kind of timeline that plays off the motif of a log and then the, played with the bark. Uh, but we always think about this holistic design as part of our development. So this is uh, one project uh, I, I would say is a resultant of some of the research that we did. And uh, it was a small installation. And when we did the research at the Boston Society of Architects, we realized that there was a lot of waste from the processing of material. And so we decided, because there existed a, block, a panelized version of wood and a stick version of wood, why not tr uh, try to develop a block version? And so this was our kind of concept about uh, building a timber version of CL, uh, CMU that is in, that's used recycling materials. Our idea was to try and develop this so that it could be uh, mass produced, but that was a very insightful learning lesson where we failed, which then helped us inform uh, the later project that I'll talk about. So this is a project called Outside In. It's a play on uh, a traditional tree bench, so rather than looking away from the material resource, you're looking right at it. And um, even the material construction itself is that idea of reversal, is that you're taking the waste, you're trying to use a majority of the cut edges that uh, have a certain embodied energy and limit the amount of processing it takes to make the component. So right here is the kind of uh, diagram and the idea is that you, know, you understand the life cycle typically over 38% of a log uh, that gets squared up uh, goes to this kind of uh, low value material and then we try to um, upcycle it to create this new timber product. So at a small scale it worked when we made it ourselves and we, had, uh, we worked on it fabrication-wise. But when we spoke to manufacturers about how to do it on mass scale, we didn't uh, really understand the regulations that were involved to build a, bring a building product to market, nor uh, the kind of machinery or the processing. It didn't translate well because it was such a customized approach. And so uh, as much as we tried, we realized since we didn't understand the system of manufacturing and certification that we weren't able to bring it to anywhere beyond this kind of interesting study. And so we tried to learn from that uh, failure and apply to uh, the next one. So here are just more kind of investigations that we did uh, to uh, try and capture more fiber, right? That's the idea is that you're trying to uh, I'll prevent more of the fiber to degrade and get released back into the environment. 
and we even did various kind of studies to understand exterior applications of uh, the material using natural kind of uh, finishes and things like that. So this is a project that uh, we just finished about a month ago. Um, it's uh, in a city called, in Columbus, Indiana, which um, some of you may be familiar with. It's uh, the sixth largest uh, concentration of modern architecture in America, which is remarkable because it's a very small city. Um, it's an incredible place for, so if you have never been there, I would encourage you to go. It's a place where you don't understand what it's like until you're there. Um, for the architects here, uh, what it did was give me hope that design can make a difference. Because as many of the architects here know, you know, we do a design and then you go through that wonderful value engineering process where then you start questioning whether or not design has any value. Does anyone care? But when you go to a place where the schools, the post office, the bank are all considered design. And you meet people, just random people who talk about how the acoustics of the space in their bank, they remember it as a kid. You, and you, you understand that they speak differently about their built environment and they don't even, they're not even aware of it. That it shows the value of what design can do. And so it was a remarkable place. So in any case, Columbus, what they did was they, uh, they were going to have a Biennale to rebrand the city because they had this wonderful design legacy, but uh, they felt that they were losing sight of that. So they invited a number of designers, architects. Uh, there was about 10 of us that came to a symposium. And we, they assigned five sites. Uh, where uh, we would compete uh, in a kind of open cage match against, uh, uh, against, the, against each other. And so we competed for, I would say, was the, the best site and the most challenging site. It was a site where there was a Henry Moore sculpture, a Saarinen church, and in front of this, which you'll see pictures of, was the IMP library. So then how do you put something within that space that works? Um, this uh, structure here is made of uh, cross-laminated timber, but it's actually made of hardwood, uh, cross-laminated timber, and a hybrid between hardwood and softwood. It's the first hardwood cross-laminated timber structure in the United States, uh, and it's the first commercial pressing of hardwood CLT here in the United States because we partnered with, we learned from the last mistake, and we partnered with a certified CLT manufacturer to realize this project. So I'll go th quickly through kind of the basic design concepts of the project and then uh, some of the processes that involved, you know, bringing a material to full commercial pressing. So Columbus, Indiana, we talked about a little bit. What was remarkable is that the reason it has such a wonderful design legacy is that uh, there was a gentleman named uh, J. Win Irwin Miller who was running the Cummings uh, Diesel Company there. And he made a deal with the city that if um, the city, when they had to build a building, list, uh, picked from a list of five architects, he would pay the architect's fee. So that was a remarkable deal, obviously, to have. But uh, Columbus was such a forward-thinking city that they gave an opportunity for young designers to build institutional buildings, which still is always even now is even a struggle for a young uh, architect to have that opportunity. And Columbus, in many ways, is a place where many young architects have uh, started their careers with institutional buildings. This is the site, as I explained. Um, it's really the main city plaza, um, where you have this Moore sculpture in front of the library. And it was a real struggle because, you know, they're very different formally. And we didn't know how to create a, a new installation that didn't disrupt the dialogue that was already occurring between the three. 
What we did recognize was that all the structures were on plinths, elevating them. And what we also realized is that when we were in Columbus, we became less interested in the architecture after a few days, but more interested in the culture and the people there of Columbus. And, but still, the, always the people and the, the kind of uh, the, the tourists come to see the architecture. But what we want to do is bring focus on this intangible sense of community and the people of Columbus. So what we decided to do was try to develop a installation that was made of plinths, which elevated the people of Columbus rather than um, creating a new kind of architectural object that was elevated to bring more attention, I guess, then to the people of Columbus. The other point of installation was to pay homage to Erwin Miller. In his home, uh, he had the first ever conversation plinth. And it's a remarkable home, but what was really, I think, unfortunate is even though that the home is uh, open to the public, no one is able to go into this conversation pit to visit it. And we thought that that was unfortunate, and we wanted to bring that conversation pit out to the public so that everyone could enjoy. So we basically have this hybrid between plinths and conversation pit to create this installation called the conversation plinth. So it's this idea of um, rooted in our idea uh, back when we developed the BSA exhibition, is how do we develop appreciation of content or arts that is wider than just the traditional uh, viewership. So rather than just uh, talking about the architecture, let's talk about the people, the people who support it, and widen the viewership. So this is what we always felt that was the relationship, is that the buildings were talking to each other, but the people weren't part of the conversation. And the thing is, is that we, I had this funny uh, experience where I went home for Thanksgiving, and uh, we didn't really know what the design was going to be. And uh, I realized that the experience that I had at Columbus was similar to what I felt like when I was a child at Thanksgiving dinner, is that when you are old enough to sit at Thanksgiving dinner, and your parents are talking about something and you want to be participate, but you can't, but you want to. I imagine that was the frustration that many people in Columbus had. So our idea was to uh, create this installation which elevated them, to honor them, and so that they could uh, be empowered by their understanding of what we recognized was their importance of uh, the area, so that they were on the same kind of uh, level, eye to eye with the existing structures around. The other kind of idea of the siting was that uh, we realized that um, this was how the circulation in Pei's uh, original design was intended to do. But whenever we went to the plaza, it was completely empty. It was, it was a little bit, it was terribly underused. And it was mostly because they added these uh, bollards there so that the rotary could no longer be used. Uh, and the parking was relocated elsewhere. So we decided to, uh, we recognized that the site was broken and we used our installation as a way of restoring the original circulation uh, uh, to the site, but also bridging the two different halves of the site to make it whole. So these were some uh, models, uh, there was a model that we made uh, of the project. So now it's its relationship to uh, CLT. So when we, we were in awe about how J. Irwin Miller brought design to Columbus through Cummings and through his use of industry. And so what we wanted to do was reciprocate in our design and uh, bring industry uh, through design. And so we recognized that there was a timber renaissance happening, but we also realized that uh, uh, Indiana's largest cash crop was hardwood, which was surprising. But what was, was even more remarkable was that over 55% of each hardwood log that gets processed goes to low value material, goes to materials like pallets and cans, which is a 
a huge percentage. And so what we thought, and especially because we recognized that there were hundreds of mills in Indiana that were failing because there was just not as much demand, uh, can we upcycle that material so that uh, we could possibly create a new marketplace, a new industry using that low grade material and upcycling to create a higher value CLT material. So by using the demonstration project as uh, proof of concept, uh, we would use that material that we developed out of this low grade material and then uh, create this uh, high value hardwood CLT to create a new industry and hopefully have such an impact such as this. Because in this endeavor to try, in this endeavor to explore how design can have impact, the idea that you know, a small little project like this could spur on someone to consider building a factory in that area to provide jobs and food for people who really need it, it gives, it demonstrates what design can actually do beyond making a sense of place in the aesthetics. And that is something that we've been constantly pursuing. But, you know, it's very easy to make this drawing, but to actually implement it, it was quite hard. And so we decided to make a group of partners here, and you can't see them, but uh, we worked with uh, national groups like the National Hardwood Lumber Association. We used, worked with the U.S. Uh, Forest Service. We worked with the certified manufacturers of CLT to work together to help develop this product. And so after we learned that we won this uh, competition, uh, we, the U.S. Forest Service, because of our relationship from the National Building Museum exhibition, encouraged us to apply for a wooden innovation grant, uh, which uh, was specific, almost was specifically catered to this project, was the to able to fund a demonstration project, but also find new wood technologies uh, and develop them. And so we applied and we found out that we were the only architecture firm to ever win the wood innovation grant of its entire existence. Um, and so it was a quarter million dollars and it's part of a two year grant that we are going to work to create a certified material uh, so that it can be used. And we are working now with uh, large companies in Indiana to figure out the viability of building such a CLT plant in that region. So always the question is, is why do you want to do hardwood CLT when there's softwood CLT already existing? And there's partly there's a cultural reason because we realized that uh, historically uh, here in the United States, uh, hardwood was the original timber structure and then later it became softwood. And so there's that kind of poetic reason why, but there are also um, kind of, there are also structural reasons why to use hardwood because structure, um, hardwood has superior mechanical properties so that there's a possibility of using less material to create, to, to make an equivalent span or height or make a panel that is even stronger than the equivalent in terms of softwood. There's the, also the idea that uh, hardwood is more resistant to fire and so a lot of the CLT panels that are created are not created necessarily just for um, structural capacity, but also to maintain a one, two, one or two hour rating. And because hardwood is more resistant to fire, it has the ability to uh, allow you to create a thinner panel, a thinner panel that is structurally more superior. Uh, we are doing explorations now where it's not just a full 100% hardwood panel, but hardwood on the face and softwood in the core or even ones where there's hardwood in the, in the, in the core and, hardwood and softwood on the face. So all these kind of hybrid solutions because you know, throughout the, the United States, there's different types of species of wood that grow. And so you have to utilize the regional materials within the area, like in New England, there's a blend of weaker softwoods, but hardwoods as well, compared to the Douglas fir that they use for, for CLT out in the West. And so to create an equal playing field, we're playing with all these kind of hybrid um, solutions. So this was some of the development. We went all the way from log and then processed the material uh, and then started doing tests. 
And so we really went through the process of doing that farm to table experience where we would go to the mills, we would uh, work with them to select the grade three common. We did a mixed species blend rather than a single source, uh, not only to uh, promote the, I, to promote the idea of having a more diverse uh, material blend and not promote the monoculture, but the idea is that also if you have a mixed species, because wood is a commodity, that uh, one species wouldn't get priced out. So when we developed this panel with the engineer from Benson Wood, we engineered to the weakest uh, uh, e-modulus of the material and so that it can be interchanged uh, based upon what is available at the marketplace during the time that the CLT has to be pressed. And here are some more kind of tests that we did uh, while we were trying to develop the, pro uh, the project. You now here, we're always constantly looking back and forward to understand the inspiration. So you can see, uh, based upon the first images of that conversation plinth, uh, where there are certain kind of things that are reminiscent about how um, we're relating it to the kind of circular forms of what a tree is. Uh, because often we feel like we've lo lost sight of what a tree is when you're processing the wood itself. You know, here's in certain of the development of the drawings, you know, laying it out on panels because the panels were 10 by 40. Um, it's almost like a cookie cutter layout. So this really was the process. And so um, it was incredibly complicated. And most of our partners, what, we, what they said at the end was that if they knew what they were getting into, they would have never agreed to do it. <laughs> so the idea was we would process uh, third grade, uh, uh, common, grade three common lumber from Indiana. But because our goal is to get it certified, and the process of getting CLT certified is that you have to do it at a CLT plant that's certified. And there's only two CLT plants in the United States. We picked the one that was the closest, which was Montana, which was you know, 2,000 miles away. Um, so we had to ship material there. Uh, what was even more surprising was the difference between the softwood culture and the hardwood culture, and how the softwood industry versus the hardwood industry process and some breakdown a log. And that was a very difficult thing to um, negotiate because uh, in the softwood industry and the way that CLT setups are laid up now is that they're all laying up uniform dimensional lumber. Whereas hardwood, when they break down a log, they do it at varied widths, uh, varied lengths. And so what we basically had to do was find a way to process grade three common as if it was grade one common but then also process it as if it was dimensional lumber. And that was uh, something that not many mills wanted to do because they were so entrenched in the idea of making furniture and flooring that they had no real interest in or understanding about the use of hardwood as uh, structural material. And so this is where we engaged uh, national partners to help us sell that message. But what we figured out was to uh, process the varied lengths into two types of widths, and rather than random widths, so that we could be more efficient. So we found a five and a half width and a three and a half width, so there'd be less waste when we processed it. And so we distributed that material between various lambs of the hardwood, so that we'd process it. What we did, what we didn't realize until um, later tests, was that the softwood. CLT processing machinery could not handle the hardwood machine, hardwood density. And so then we had to split the way that things were processed. So we had to process more at the hardwood facilities and then send it to Montana to do other processes. But what was an uh, incredible headache was the fact that um, you have to plane the material to activate the surface so that the glue penetration uh, would um, we activate the pores of the surface so that you could get robust glue adhesion. But if you planed it and waited too long, the pores would close. So we had a 10-year window where the wood was planed in, um, in Indiana and shipped by truck quickly to uh, Montana and quickly pressed so that it would, the surface would remain active. And so, 
Well, we came to learn is that it was incredibly important to understand the system. Because if we didn't understand the system, just like we didn't understand the system when we developed the outside-in project, that fell apart. And we, we learned from that, but we didn't really understand the full system of production or the differences between production between industries that could, uh, dis uh, uh, could have uh, disrupted the entire project in entirety. But luckily, it all worked out. So here are some pictures of uh, all the material being loaded into the press. This is a, a video of the press. So this is, a, this is a picture of the first ever pressing of hardwood CLT here in the United States. I think it's, um, it's unusual for a small firm to be able to do something like this, but it shows uh, what an exciting time it is uh, in terms of timber technology. It's that the rules have not been figured out. Uh, everybody's voice is, has an opportunity to be heard. Um, it's an a industry that's still developing at a rapid pace. So this is a 40 foot by 10 foot panel that's coming out of the press. Some kind of, these are some detailed shots of the CNC. There's a major CNC kind of layout press. The shipping of this. So we basically, I mean, just for myself, it was eye-opening to try and figure out all the finances to make it work. The idea of understanding how transport is such a large component in terms of realizing this project. So we had to decide if it was worth it to have one more truck, which cost another $5,000, but then there was delays here and there. So it was this incredible thing. So I used to always hate when someone asked me, do you like this building? Because there's so many invisible forces that have led to what that building is. And it's not fair, unless you know the entire story, to give judgment on that building. But what this experience, when you're trying to even develop a, pro uh, a product, and you're going from beginning to end, it's just remarkable how much you know, you're designing the entire evolution of it. And it was a really wonderful experience. So uh, there was a local co uh, company called Taylor Brothers who did the installation. They had never used CLT before. They estimated it would be two and a half weeks to do the installation. They did it under two weeks. Um, it just demonstrates how easy it is to put this material together. Yes. So, you know, it would, uh, we put a, a clear uh, water based uh, urethane on the wood with multiple coats. Because this is a temporary structure, we didn't go through the processes that would uh, make it in a permanent exterior uh, structure. But in this development, in this next two years, we are developing an exterior grade panel using other processes called uh, thermally treated lumber. And which um, is a heating process that allows the material to be more stable when uh, absorbing moisture. So this is it. It's up here for two more months in Columbus. This is just a statistic. It had 44 tons of wood in it. And uh, just the use of this alone, of the material here, is the equivalent of the sequestering of the emission of 17 cars a year. And the material, when it's done, it's going to be uh, reused for other applications in the city. And then a lot of the material will be donated to a number of the local schools so that it will definitely have a life of its own. And here's a kind of time lapse of the entire construction. What's really satisfying is, is that since this has been built um, 
there's been a lot of conversations already about bringing a plant there. It's, uh, I'll be actually back here in uh, uh, Nashville in two weeks to speak at the National Hardwood Lumber Association because they even recognize uh, that uh, there is this robust, robust marketplace for hardwood CLT that exists. And the funny thing is, is that I contacted them before this structure was built and they didn't want to talk. But because they saw it completed, they saw the, uh, almost the massive quality of it, it proved to them that there was a possibility of this. And so, at least in the small part, it satisfied that urge or that desire that can design have a larger impact beyond just the aesthetic. That's it. I don't know if anyone has any questions. Maybe I went a little over, so. How long is it up It's up uh, till for another month and a half. Um, the, there's about 18 different installations. So there were five for, from up and coming architects. There were smaller installations from uh, other designers and from kind of local colleges. Uh, so it's a great time to go, I would say. Yep. Uh, and obviously when you're doing that, the bias of the fabric matters and all that stuff. Does the cross lamination take away the concern of how you orient all the, the pieces so that you can get the most out of each slab? Or? Uh, that's a great question. Um, so there are, there are major lambs and minor lambs. Uh, it, what we did was we had to orient the major lamps, which is the hardwood, in the direction of which, in the direction that it was spanning. So because we were using hardwood, in some of the panels we used hardwood on the outer faces and softwood in the core, we had to be very careful about directions of spanning. But uh, it was like um, you know, pattern making or like um, Christmas cookies or something. But uh, when we worked with the engineer, we had to, very carefully uh, do that so that it would span in the right direction. Um, in one of the images uh, I, I failed to mention is that the 100% hardwood slabs are at uh, the foundations that are directly above the columns. And we specifically put those there because if they were softwood, the columns would have punched through the slab. So there was an incredible punch here because there's so much immense weight that's going down on the columns. So uh, we, we developed the panel and the engineer did all that work uh, where he, uh, he figured out that because we didn't want a huge column capital, uh, if we made it out of hardwood, it wouldn't shear, punch shear through the slab. Yes? What is the impact of the glue on the flammability of the product? I wouldn't say the, the glue doesn't um, have uh, a direct impact. I think uh, that uh, once the char is created, the the, the kind of the uh, the depth of the flammability is only limited to that kind of char surface. Yes. C L T. It's cross laminated timber, but it's a uh, you know there are now many different versions of this now of this mass timber. Construction. They're doing ones that are called like DLT, which is dowel laminated lumber, where they're trying to put dowels in rather than using glues. There's ICLT, where they're using this kind of dovetailing technique uh, rather than using glues. They're using nail laminated lumber, where they're using nail rather than glue. So there's the, this idea of using small pieces of wood to make massive panels. Uh, there's many of different approaches to that. Um, we've done this hybrid approach using hardwood and softwood. There are places that are doing uh, softwood with engineered materials in the center. Um, and so who knows what other kind of technologies or uh, developments that will happen, maybe tomorrow. Yes? Is there any resistance from builders um, for that project about assembling a material that they might not be familiar with? Or were they pretty open to the idea of assembling a CLT panel? I guess like a follow-up question would be, as architects, 
Are there resources that we can go to to understand how buildings are put together? Yes. Yes. So I would first suggest that you go to uh, Woodworks. Uh, they uh, they will. There's a regional person probably of this area that if you have questions about timber, uh, they have engineers on staff that will help. I mean, I, I think the problem always is is that as architects, um, you spend maybe a day learning about timber construction and nothing else. And even engineers, um, they don't know much about timber construction. Uh, so there, there, I would suggest you go to that organization and their website. There's another website called Rethink Wood uh, that is uh, uh, primary focused on advocating about timber construction. Uh, but there is actually, there is a lot of um, resistance in terms of working with a new material. Uh, a lot of uh, CLT projects, they die because when priced out, because there's an unknown factor, contractors add additional, you know, they pad the numbers. But time and time again, when you speak to a contractor who's went through the process, they realize how easy it was. Um, but there's companies like Smartlam who now, who manufacture material, that they are organizing um, contractor classes where they will fly contractors out, teach them how the process of hoisting the material, understanding and get their hands on it so that hopefully that, um, uh, that kind of issue of padding the numbers will be eliminated. I mean, there's a lot of also incentive, I think, um, uh, from a government standpoint. So in New England, where I'm from, uh, both Massachusetts and Maine are trying to bring CLT manufacturing to that region. And so I've been speaking with um, state officials about how uh, potentially how do you uh, bring incentives to developers because right now, because there's limitations of how tall you can build with timber, uh, but you can build uh, to allow for variances, uh, to build taller with timber, but even to encourage more timber construction that if they include timber construction as part of the uh, construction of the building, they can add even more floors. Um, so it has a multi-prong, I think, um, way of trying to solve this issue. There's still a lot of code challenges No, I, I think the I think the real difficulty is uh, mis, mis, not understanding. Uh, all the testing data is out. Uh, it is uh, it can meet all one or two hour ratings when sized correctly. From a seismic standpoint, the testing is there. I think more it's that people are just unsure about the material because it's so new, um, and so it's a question of if the local, you know, the fire department will approve that material, right? Or if local officials will approve the material. Because even if uh, IBC changes um, to allow for taller uh, mass timber buildings, often the state kind of regulations rule. And so based upon the region, um, that's an, that's, I think that's the biggest hurdle. Uh, in, if you look at a map, most of the mass timber buildings are happening out west because they have a kind of til timber culture there, so there's already deep understanding. But not, there was supposed to be a timber building um, that won a, a U.S. Uh, Forest Service uh, competition in New York City, uh, but that um, died uh, for a multitude of reasons. But I, uh, I think uh, it's this kind of misunderstanding of how to use the material, even though that the facts are already out there. Anything else? Yes. Uh, I saw the pictures that you had of the beautiful interior finishes and applications of it, but when you're talking about building large scale, what about the exterior? Yeah. Or what, is it clad with something else? Or is it right now, most mass timber buildings are clad with a different type of system because uh, still that kind of um, panel is not uh, yet suitable. Uh, but there has, there's in just recently, there's been a uh, building in London that's used uh, thermally treated uh, lumber and clad it on top of a mass timber panel uh, called the Maggie Center. So I, soon they will, I'm sure they will develop a panel uh, that can be used on an exterior application. But right now, it's relegated to 
the interior kind of shell of the primary structure. I, I, I wouldn't say it's, it's, there are some people building with small, with small homes with mass uh, timber, but it, I would say it's not appropriate. It's more about, I would say, like six to 12 story building is the sweet spot for this material. Um, much smaller, it just makes sense to do it out of lightweight framing materials, but there's this, uh, what I understand is that between this kind of five and six to 12 story, it doesn't, it's the sweet spot between whether or not you go to the steel and then this lightweight framing. And so there's this kind of gray area that where the economics and the number to work. But the reality is that the majority of buildings in the United States are within you know, that range. It's not, uh, even though there's a race to build these tallest buildings, that's not, if the goal is to get as much uh, build, wood timber products into built structures, it's within that range is actually the the, the best target area to make a kind of impact through in the environment. Yes? Are, are most of your, uh, your uh, glues and your finishes, are they all petroleum based products? No, there's been a lot of uh, development, I think, in that. I mean, some, a lot of, some of the glues are, I mean, uh, but you know, they've been developing soy based glues and things like that. So, glue technology, I think, is. Uh, another technology that is racing to catch up as well. What alternative are you using for your sources? What, what do you use for, if you're going to have something other than a petroleum-based product for your glue, what are you, what are you sourcing? I mean, I know that, uh, I'm not an expert on glues, but I, I know that this always people are concerned about the toxicity of glues, right? And um, there is, I think, concern of that, but if you then compare it to what the equivalent is in terms of steel and concrete, uh, I think the impact of some of these glues compared of what the normal way, or the conventional way of building, there's still not a comparison to be made. And so I don't think we can go 100% like pure, but we can get better. And that's reason enough to go in that direction. Yes. I was just going to ask about the glues, and I know you're not an expert in it, but I'm, you know, the, the concern I think is moisture exposure over long periods of time, yep. and then the, the, the heat, the glues breaking down. Yeah. And I was just curious if there's been advancements in that technology. I mean, they are making advancements in that. I mean, um, but it is a concern. Even you know, in the in the structure that we did uh, soon after, because of the way that the moisture enters in and the way that the sun hits it and the imbalance of the moisture content on the face, the material moves. And the material, no matter how strong the glues are, the material will move independently. And so that's why we're trying all these different applications. So if you come back in about six months, I'll have a better answer for you. So when you said the material thing, what actually started? What did you see? So because for our project, because we used uh, grade three common, um, you know, the material 